The sound's working pretty well this evening, and I think what it is is that I, th I think the batteries are failing. So it might just, I just went, it was popping when I turned it on earlier, and so I went back and changed out a battery. I've been, it, the batteries, when I initially got the rechargeable ones for it, were lasting four or five services or more without needing to be changed. But I think that the batteries are you now getting old. So I just ordered a couple on Amazon instead of singing a little bit ago. So we're all set. <laughs> I'm kidding you about that. I was singing while I ordered them on Amazon. <laughs> Put your cell phones away. Uh, if you see me on my cell phone in church, I'm just being a good example of a bad example. Okay, so no justification in it for you. Uh, at all. It's not okay. So put your cell phone away and uh, don't allow it to be a distraction from you giving God 100% of your heart, your time, and your attention. It really is, is vitally important. We don't want to be legalist about how we behave, our behavior in, in church services, but it is really important that we do create an atmosphere where our hearts are conducive or where it's conducive for the Lord to speak to our heart. I'm always surprised at how much difference truth affects a soft heart and a hard heart. I have been to services where the Word of God is preached and literally people would say to me, you know what, God really spoke to me and God did a great work in my heart. And I've had other people say, you know what, I mean, I just don't know what, it just seems like the, those people are spiritually dead, that preaching's dead, the effect of it's dead. And you know, the difference isn't, it's the same place, same service, but different hearts. And we want to have soft hearts, not stony hearts. So, deliberately on purpose, resolve that there's nothing going to be between you and the Savior, and particularly when you come into the place of fellowship. And so, work hard on just little things that make it more conducive atmosphere for God to speak to your heart. Well, I would like to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 14. We'll read four verses, and we'll look at why Samson is a good example of a bad example. Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath, of the daughter of the Philistines, and came up and told his father and mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. <clears throat> now therefore get her for me to wife. And his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, among all my people, that thou goest to take away for the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. I heard a lot of messages preached on this text. Ended right there. But let's read verse 4 so that we can actually have a solid context. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Father, I pray that you would help us this evening to see the good examples in the life of Samson, to see you and to see the God that Samson knew. And then God, I pray that you'd help us to see the bad example and see ourselves and God, the example that we can avoid. And we praise you for what you'll do now in advance, thanking you. Amen. So we've been looking at good examples of bad examples for some time now. I wanted to end my series but this is one, you know, y'all know my wife writes my sermons, right? If you don't like my sermon, it came from my wife. And this last week she basically said, you're not done with your series because you haven't preached on Samson yet. You can't have a good example of bad examples without preaching. You were there, you heard it, didn't you, Anthony, when she said that? So it's almost exactly verbatim what she said, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, all right, so Anthony's my witness. This is almost exactly what she said. <laughs> Don't let them intimidate you, Anthony. Stay strong. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, there are so many, when I look at good examples of bad examples, there are so many uh, things that we can learn from in the life of individuals that really fit with the series that we've been preaching. And this really is a character study. You may know it's a little out of character for me to preach character studies instead of expositions through uh, portions of the Scripture, but I think that these things are incredibly helpful, useful, and uh, very, very practical. Now, one of the reasons, one of the things that we've reviewed over and again, one of the reasons why we would emphasize individuals in the Scripture who are a bad example is to cement in our mind or 
even if you could say to counteract the kind of teaching or thinking that sets up people in the Bible and it makes it as though God used this person, therefore everything this person did is good. A lot of times that happens, and I will be quite frank with you, some of the worst preaching I've ever heard is along those lines. And matter of fact, some of the worst theology I've ever heard are along those lines. Matter of fact, one happened this last week uh, on social media, which is, of course, the end all for reason and uh, <laughs> good discussions and so forth. Somebody on social media, who I don't know, who happens to be one of my fake friends on social media, asked the question of whether or not strong drink is acceptable or not. And, you know, this is all the rage right now. Matter of fact, it's, it's actually tragic, actually, isn't it? That Christians don't know whether strong drink is okay. And they don't understand the, even the definition of the word wine means fruit of the vine and so forth. And that the Scripture does distinguish between the two. And then the, the notion that, you know, people back in the Bible, you know, back in the Bible days, as we've said a couple of times, that those people didn't know how to make fresh make fresh juice or how to preserve things. And the funny thing about, about strong drink, and, I, and this is not what I'm preaching about this evening, but it is an example of it, and it's actually in our context because Samson took a Nazarite vow and his, his parents were told not to drink wine or strong drink while they were carrying him, and those distinctions were actually made in that context. A lot of Christians think that if you take grape juice and you let it sit for a little bit, that it will just turn into hard liquor. And I'm not really experienced with hard liquor. You know, you could tell me proofs of alcohol and so forth. And I'm just, I'm just about as ignorant as can be. But I'll tell you something I know that those people don't know. And that's if you take grape juice and let it sit out for a while, it'll turn sour. It'll turn into vinegar. And it'll be just horrid tasting. The process of creating alcohol, you have to add uh, some yeast. You say, well, Pastor, there is, there is some, you know, there's a degree of yeast or bacteria on the skins of the grapes that will cause it to ferment. You know, there's so much that it turned to a really, really rotten, uh, really rotten vinegar. And that's a fact. A couple of other things that people are just completely ignorant of. And by the way, I've just never seen anybody just hit the vinegar hard. And, you know, just, like, you know, I mean, honestly, vinegar has alcohol in it, you know. If you drink like two gallons, you'll get a buzz. No kidding. Uh, uh, but, I mean, that's just a fact that somehow... People that are supposed to have brains are willfully just ignorant of, and they think, you know, back in the Bible days, I mean, you squeeze grapes and they turned to alcohol, and so everybody drank. You know, the water was so terrible. That's another silly thing, too. The people couldn't drink the water in the area that they live in. You ever heard of immunity or building up a, an immunity towards something? Uh, all you have to do is just drink the water. You'll get sick for a while, but after a while, it won't make you sick anymore. And seriously, you'll, you'll build up an immunity to it. So there's just so many notions that are downright ignorant about strong drink. Uh, but the fact is, is that in the Scripture, every time anybody ever did get drunk, they did so, it seems, as though it was done to them on purpose or they did so on purpose, and terrible <coughs> things happened. There's never a good example of anybody drinking strong drink and having a good outcome. There's no good outcome in it. So my point being this. There are a lot of things that people say, well, it happened. And it's recorded in the Scripture. And so it must be good because the Bible's a good book. Well, there are a lot of horrid things recorded in the Scripture. And the notion that God endorses or puts a stamp on something just because of either the person who committed it uh, or because it's recorded in the Scripture that God is for it, my friend, is, is fallacious. It's not, it's not logical, it's not reasonable, it actually makes no sense. And so I've heard lots and lots of messages where people talk about this happened in the Bible. I, I heard somebody who was a proponent of breaking up of marriages and, uh, and remarrying and doing it over and over again and so forth. I heard someone a while back say, well, you know, polygamy was, was allowed in the Old Testament. I mean, God allowed polygamy in the Old Testament. And so it wasn't until the New Testament that we had any kind of marriage standards. Nonsense! Jesus said it was not so from the beginning. <coughs> God created them male and female, and male and female created He them. And what did He say? What? 
the two become one. Yeah, he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and these two, not three or four or ten or whatever, uh, shall become one flesh. And Jesus said, What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And so marriage has never been polygamous. Marriage has never been anything more than what God created it to be. And when you start playing that game and you start going down that road, my friend, it's small wonder that if Christians can redefine marriage that our Supreme Court thinks that they can as well. It's hypocritical, actually, for a Christian who thinks they can redefine marriage to have a problem with the Supreme Court re redefining. Now, I did not say I don't have a problem with the Supreme Court. I do have a problem with the wicked decision that our Supreme Court made a couple of years ago. But I unfortunately can see where they're coming from because if Christians can redefine marriage, then why can't they? In other words, if marriage isn't what God says it is, if it can be anything other than what God says it is, then who's to say? Who gets to say what marriage is? Okay, so that's another good example of a bad example. Uh, last week we looked at Jonah, and we looked at some reasons why Jonah was a good example of a bad example. Two weeks ago we looked at Hezekiah, and of course the classic good example of a bad example <coughs> is our, our fellow uh, Balaam. He probably is the most mentioned in the Bible. Good example, a bad example. Balaam is the equivalent of the Bible's Benedict Arnold. Now, for you that grew up back in days when they educated you in school, you know who Benedict Arnold is. I, uh, I'm afraid that many of our youth, that's just a strange word, and they don't know who Benedict Arnold was. But you know who Benedict Arnold is? You don't know. That's tragic because he goes to, he, he's like uh, one of those smart kid schools where they get extra education. <laughs> and he doesn't know who Benedict Arnold is. And it's not your fault. It's not because you aren't intelligent. It's because you have been robbed with your education. And we won't blame you for that. But uh, get educated anyway. All right, so it'll help you yeah. but, but Balaam is the Bible's Benedict Arnold. In other words, he is the Bible's good example of a bad example. Uh, he's the guy that did everything wrong. Well, now, let's go to our text this evening, and I want to look at Samson. Again, the reason I'm preaching this message, my wife wrote this one. If you don't like it, it's a flop. It's uh, entirely on her, and Anthony is my witness. And so, <laughs> I'm kidding you about that. I don't write sermons anyway. I just preach the Bible. So, verse 1, uh, we, we, I'm assuming that we're all introduced to Samson. If not, I take the time and brush up a little bit. But verse 1, we usually... I read this passage of Scripture, and it usually ends at verse 3 where Samson is being a brat and demands to his parents, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. And then we have a message preached about the reason Samson went wrong is because his parents just did whatever he wanted, and they indulged him, and he was spoiled. And that's why Samson had a terrible life, is because he had bad parents. And actually, the Scripture says that his parents didn't know that it was of the Lord. And so I submit to you that verse 4 uh, disqualifies every message that's preached, implying that Samson was not supposed to marry this girl. The Bible says that he sought occasion against the Philistine. And so in the Scripture, it says, His father and his mother knew not that he was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Let me ask you a practical question. The question is this. Could God take a man having a Nazarite vow and have him to marry a Philistine or a person who would be unclean? Could God, or the question could be, would God do that? Would God have a man like Samson who is even among Israel under a people that have said about God's law that we will put ourselves under the jurisdiction. We'll keep God's law. Joshua told him, don't do this. God's law is too much. You can't keep God's law. And they said, we will. We're going to. So a people who have placed themselves under God's law, could God or would God have Samson marry a Philistine on the basis of God's law? You tell me. Yeah, I got a lot of no's. Any yeses? You say yes? Okay, thank you. Anybody? Any more yeses? Good, good. Well, let's think of some examples, shall we? Hosea. Was Hosea's marriage by command, by permission, or uh, because of his own will? It was by command. What kind of a woman did God tell Hosea to marry? A harlot. Okay, so God told him to marry that kind of a woman. Okay, so the question is, would it be in the character of God to have Samson marry a Philistine woman? Okay, let's talk about some more examples. Ruth, Moabitess. 
pretty much, you know, not the same thing because it would have been descendants of Esau, and uh, but uh, also of Ishmael. Uh, but yeah, God. What about Tamar? What about Rahab? What about Rahab? She would have been a Canaanite. She would have been pagan as could be. Now, here is something that the Scripture does not say, and I'm not going to add anything that's not in the Scripture. The Bible does not say that this Philistine girl that Samson was going to marry in Timnath, the Scripture does not say that she was a believer, that she had chosen the God of Israel. She didn't have a Ruth moment where she said to Naomi or Naomi, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. Or a Tamar moment where she actually wanted to, she wanted that, uh, that birthright. She wanted to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Or a Rahab moment where she wanted uh, to be a part of God's people. So I'm not going to take the Scripture that far, but I will say this. All we know from the Bible is that the Scripture says that Samson said, or that the, that the, the Word of God says, that his parents didn't know it was of the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, there's God's perfect will, God's, uh, what is it, God's permissible will and all that nonsense. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere, by the way. But uh, there's you know different types of the will of God, so God allowed Samson. No, the Bible actually says here that it was of the Lord. <coughs> That's what the Bible says. And if you think that you know more than that, uh, you know more than I can know, and you know more than anyone actually could know. If you'd say, no, he should not have married this woman, uh, actually, um, I'm not sure how you could say that when the Bible says it's of the Lord. We don't find that this woman is unfaithful. We don't find uh, that this woman is even called, she's a daughter of the Philistines, a daughter of uncircumcised, so obviously her family are not of the Lord. But could she have been sanctified? Could she have become a proselyte? Uh, I'd argue she didn't want to because she didn't leave her father's house when they got married, right? So, But then again, you could say, well, that really never was able to culminate in possibility. And you could say that Timnath should have been really within the coast of Israel. And so, you know, it's not necessarily that she should have left that area. Okay, so we could debate that all day long. But here's what we know. The Bible says it was of the Lord. And so I'm not going to uh, really, I don't need to have an opinion about it. The Bible says that he sought occasion against the Philistines. Now, why would God seek occasion against the Philistines? Or why would Samson seek occasion against the Philistines? What? They had dominion over Israel. Yeah, the Bible says in, in uh, what is it, verse... Uh, oh yeah, verse 4, yeah. At that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now, did God want His people to be in bondage? No, but there's a reason why they were in bondage. If you were to go back to chapter 13 and verse 1, you'd see, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. So, why were they in the hand of the Philistines? Well, because they did evil against God. And God gave them the consequences for it. They became, became servants of evil. They became servants of the evil uh, Philistines. And as servants of the Philistines, they've got a problem. And here we're going to see a good example of, of, of Samson here in Judges 14. Actually, uh, this is the passage of Scripture we're in. Samson isn't a bad example in this passage of Scripture. You know about uh, the wedding feast that happened, uh, the, the things that happened. There's a lot of stories of supernatural things that happened with Samson. But uh, after Samson's wedding... After the feast, if you look down at verse 12, Samson said unto them, these are the young men at the feast, the Philistine men, Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if ye can certainly declare it me within seven, the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I'll give you thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. But if ye cannot declare it to me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty change of garments? And they said unto him, Put forth the, thy riddle, that we may hear it. And he made his riddle. Out of the eater came forth meat, out of the strong came forth sweetness, and they could not in three days expound the riddle. You know what the riddle was. Samson had had a lion come and attack him. He grabbed it and ripped it apart. And then when he came back by, honeybees had made a, a uh, honeycomb in the carcass of the lion. And so the very same thing that was an eater uh, became meat and became something sweet. So... That was the answer to the riddle. There's no way anybody would guess that. Actually, would you guess that if you didn't know the story? Out of the eater came forth 
meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And he's talking about a lion that he killed. Now, don't judge Samson on the cleverness of his riddle. I personally don't think it was all that terribly clever. I think it was like, yes, an experience that happened to only me that only I know about, and if you can guess it, then, you know, I'll give you 30 changes of garments. So, they, they got his wife to turn against him. Verse 17, she went before them him the seven days, and while the feast lasted, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people, and the men of the city, said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? He said unto them, I love this, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you had not found out my riddle. <laughs> and so, you say, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, I don't think his riddle was very good, but I do like his analogy of how they figured out his riddle. Okay, so he said, If you had not taken advantage of a relationship that you should not have had with my wife, then you would not have figured this out. And what did Samson do? Well, he went down to the Philistines and he killed 30 Philistines and took their garments and paid them in Philistine. And paid them with, you know, Philistine changes of garments. Okay. Was Samson justified in doing so? It doesn't seem God had a problem with it. It seems as though what they did and what his wife did were very wrong. Okay, so now after this happened, they got angry with uh, Samson, and in verse 19, uh, we see the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him, and went, he went down to Ashkelon, slew thirty men of them, and took their spoil, and gave changes of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. Well, then Samson, verse 15, it came to pass, within chapter 15, verse 1, within a while after, in the time of the wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I'll go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her, therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. He said, what they've done is much more wrong than what I'm going to do. And he went and caught... The Bible says 300 foxes. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm impressed with a guy's ability to capture 300 foxes, tie their tails together, light them on fire, and turn them loose in the Philistines' fields. I don't know what it must have looked like. I, I imagine, okay, everybody have a, like an imagination, like if you see it in cartoon or you see it like in film, how this must have looked. I imagine Samson having a gunny sack, kind of like Santa Claus, you know, a bag. And, and he's, he's catching his foxes and putting them in his bag. And he's, you know, the guy had, when the spirit of power came, the spirit of power came on him, he had exceptional strength. How does a guy catch a fox? Well, how does a guy rip a lion in half? How does a guy kill a thousand people with a jawbone of a donkey? Well, it's not possible without supernatural ability. But he catches 300 foxes, ties their tails together, lights them on fire, and, you know, he's walking along with his fox bag and he tosses a fox out. You know, here, light this one up. I think he, I don't know if he had a lighter. <laughs> Brother, you know, they talk about smoking camels. These are smoking foxes here in the scripture. It says, Samson turns them loose, burns up all the Philistines' fields, and they're not happy about it. Understandably so, right? So, then the scripture says in verse 6, Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So it's, it's one of these, you get revenge, I get revenge, you get revenge, I get revenge scenarios. So they plow with his heifer, and so he kills uh, guys, 30 guys from Ashkelon and pays his debt using them. And so they said, well, uh, then, and his, the Bible says his anger was kindled. He was over it. But then he went to go back to his wife, and her father-in-law had given her to his friend. And now he doesn't. Now he's been wronged in this relationship, and it made him angry again, so he went and caught 300 foxes, lit them on fire, turned them loose. Now the Philistines are mad. They said, who did this? And they said, well, it's the guy from Timnath's son-in-law. Well, why is the son-in-law mad? Well, he, they gave, he gave his daughter to another man after he'd given, him, given her to 
Samson, and they said, oh, well, that's understandable. So they said, well, we'll fix him. And they went and burned him and his daughter with fire. And it's sort of symbolic. You know, you burn our friends with fire, we'll burn you with fire. And so it's just revenge, revenge, revenge is the scenario right now. And the question is, at this point, has Samson sinned? Well, the Bible doesn't say so. In other words, the Bible says that he sought occasion, and he is seeking to be blameless. I will say this about Samson, and I think that we're going to see the danger of this. Samson has a rather cavalier clarity when it comes to right and wrong. Now, the Bible says that there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that, which is right in their own eyes. And Samson was a judge in Israel who was responsible for people doing things right. And so he was really working to justify. And Samson did have a habit of, of justification of his actions. In other words, you did this, therefore it's okay for me to do this. And I'm not quite sure that's the way God works, is it? In other words, this wrong balances this wrong, or this wrong makes me feel better. For, for Samson, it really was a matter of his wrath being kindled. In other words, I'm so mad, I'm going to do something, and I'm going to do something so terrible that uh, it'll make me feel better. And so he did. He did things that were bad enough that, okay, I'm not mad anymore. And uh, the, the Scripture doesn't have a lot of commentary about it. But in verse 7, Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I'll cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock of Elam, of Etam. Now, here's what's happened. This is a matter of you do this, and then I do this. So you do wrong to me, and here's how I respond. And this is the way it's going, and it's escalating. It's really escalating. You know, it started with 30 guys dead. That's kind of a big deal. And then it ended up with Samson's uh, father-in-law and wife dead. And that's kind of taken it up another notch. And now Samson goes out and just slaughters a whole bunch of Philistines. And that's taking up another notch. And now there's, there are problems. Who is Israel in bondage to? Philistines. The Philistines. And Samson is of the tribe of Gath, an Israelite. And so now Samson is stirring things up among the Philistines, and the children of Israel are in bondage to them. It's not really a good thing when somebody has the upper hand to aggravate them. Sort of the little brother syndrome. You guys know what? Anybody here have a little brother? Little brother syndrome. What's little brother syndrome? If you have one, you know what it is. You know, little brother messes with you. I don't care how big a little brother gets, how old little brother gets, how strong little brother gets. He can never beat big brother. That's just, there's a cardinal uh, written, it's probably a written and unwritten law, but it's certainly true in every instance I can think of. And so big brother holds little brother down and says, you better apologize. And little brother spits in his face. You know, he's got his arms... You know, he's got his arms on his side. He's pinned. I'm not saying this has ever happened in my personal experience, but I know little brothers do this kind of thing. So he's got his arms pinned. Big brother's sitting on him. And big brother says, if you, if you don't say you're sorry, you know, you're in a lot of trouble. And he goes, you know, and spits in his face. You know what I'm talking about? That's what little, little brother syndrome. And Israel's little brother here. In other words, they don't have the upper hand. And what happens when little brother spits in big brother's face? He's not really in a good position to be doing things like that. You know, you have the old sternum tap. You hold him down, just tap his sternum with your middle knuckle and turn it until it turns black and blue. If he tells mom you threaten to kill him, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, little brother, big brother stuff. Okay, whatever the thing is. And it just gets worse. Well, God is using Samson to seek occasion in Israel because God's plan is bigger than Samson's petty life. Samson's petty. He wants to marry a Philistine girl. Samson's petty. He wants revenge because they plowed with his heifer. Samson's petty. He wants revenge because they hurt his unfaithful wife and father. Samson's petty. He, and it just goes on and on and on, but it's escalating and all of a sudden, things are not between Samson and the Philistines any longer. Things are... You know what? He's an Israelite. You guys are responsible for him. If you don't cage your tiger, if you don't, if you don't lock up your dog, then you're going to have problems. And that's exactly what's happened at this point in time. Now the Philistines have come out and they're camping around the children of Israel. And all of a sudden, everybody's wide-eyed and saying, what are we going to do? Samson, you cause... You know, we're in trouble! The Bible says the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, 
Why are you come up against us? So here they are. They're out, you know, tending their business. They're paying their taxes to the Philistines, and they look out, and the Philistines are, you know, setting themselves in array. They're camping, and it's not, you know, like a pleasure trip. It's like if you wake up and you realize a whole bunch of people are camping in your front yard, and it's really not scenic there. There's nothing really to see there. Why are you here? You guys look like you're here for no. They said, "Yeah, we're here to kill you. You're in trouble." And so then, in verse, in verse uh, ten, they said, "Why are you come up against us?" They said, "To bind Samson, are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us?" Now here's the betrayal, and here's the cowardice. And I don't blame Samson for not being terribly impressed with his countrymen. Then three thousand men of Judah went to the top of the rock Etam and said to Samson, "Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us?" Hey, Samson, have you been checking the politics lately? Do you, do you realize the ramifications? Do you know who these guys are that you're messing with? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so have I done unto them. Do it to me, do it back. Yeah, <laughs> Samson. So, that's his answer. And they said unto him, We're come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee in the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. <coughs> okay. Uh, you know the story, right? They tie up Samson. His own countrymen tie him up and turn him over to the Philistines. Now you say, Pastor, well, they knew you couldn't keep Samson tied up. Well, I'm actually not sure that they knew that. There is something about cowardice that is just absolutely despicable to me. And I have to be honest with you, these men of Judah don't impress me very much here. If your nation is a theocracy and God is supposed to be the one who tells you how to live and what to do, and you have Philistines standing in for God, my friend, you ought to resent it enough to at least die. I'm going to tell you, there are some things that would be better to be dead than to live under. And if you're a child of God, it would be better to be dead than be in bondage to the Philistines. And that's just the way I feel about it. And I think I'm right about it. And Samson has actually stood up to these individuals. And now because it's brought them problems, instead of them joining ranks with him and saying, okay, Samson, you got us in this mess and now we're all going to have to fight. You better lead us. You go ahead and start things off, you know, and we'll... We'll tally up the numbers or something. We'll help you count all the Philistines you take off. No, they betray him. We came here to tie you up, Samson. Now, you think they could tie Samson up? <laughs> no. He took the gates of the city and carried him up the hill and left him there. You know, see, you see what he does here? He says, okay, go ahead and tie me up with two strong ropes. They tie him up with two strong ropes. And they take him to the Philistines. He's trussed up like a pig. And he's all tied up, ready to cook. They hand him over to the Philistines and he goes... Pow! Pops his ropes loose and lays in killing them. Starts killing them. Just, just kills thousands of them. Or not, not, well, let's see, what's the numbers? Let's read them. Uh, yeah, in verse 16, <coughs> Samson said, he takes a donkey, a donkey's jaw, jawbone of an ass. In verse 15, he put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. Took a, do a jawbone of a donkey and he killed a thousand guys with it. Now, here's the question Can a man do that? Can a man do that? No. So whose strength is, is Samson relying on? God's. Now here's the tragedy, and this is where we get to Samson being a bad example. See, at this point, the fact is that this is where Samson's being a judge ends. Samson isn't actually such a terrible fellow. The reality of it is, is that he's not impressive as far as, his, as far as his persona goes. His affiliation with the Philistines and his desire for revenge for himself is something that you look at and you say, Samson, that's going to be a problem if you don't change that. Samson, if you don't get that desire for revenge out of you, that's going to be a problem. But at this point, anybody going to, anybody going to tax the men at Judah? The Philistines going to come up and camp around Judah now? No, at this point, he's been used for good. At this point, because he has sought occasion against the Philistines, it's been good for God's people. But there's something in Samson that is lurking. There's, there's a sleeping giant in Samson that's going to be his demise. Well, let's look at the second thing that Samson did. I want to go back to verse 14, chapter 14 first, 
and look at verse 4 because I want you to notice something that's missing in chapter 16 and verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 4, the Bible says, But his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. So why did Samson marry a wife of the Philistines? The Bible said it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion of the Philistines. And I want you to notice something missing in chapter 16 and verse 1. The Bible says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. And then in verse 2, And his parents said, Why are you doing this? And Samson said, It's of the Lord. No, that's actually missing, actually, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See, what's missing here is that Samson has, along with this desire for revenge, has culminated or gotten this attitude of God is going to rubber stamp anything I do. Literally, Samson, if you look carefully at the text, you'll see Samson thinks God is just going to endorse whatever he does. Samson, you want to do that? Well, that would normally be wrong, but in your case, go ahead. And that's the notion that he's taken. And now you see him visiting a harlot. And of course, there is a bad consequence of that. And they, 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 surrounded, they surrounded the city while he was there. The Bible says they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. They're quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when stay, we'll kill him. The Bible says, And Samson lay till midnight, rose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that's before Hebron. He said, let's lock him in. And let's wait in the gates. <coughs> we'll get him. Samson gets up and he takes the gates, massive gates. These are entrances that carts and so forth could go through. These are secure gates that are supposed to withstand the battering of a ram. And he takes the gates and he picks them up. He takes the pillars that they're attached to and picks those up, probably stacks them up, throws them on his shoulder and carries them up to the top of a hill in Hebron. Takes them on a trip and says, okay, there's your gates. Come get them, boys. They decided not to capture him that night. Now, it's a, I mean, honestly, it's thrilling reading, actually, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's pretty much, you know, you're like, wow, you know, Superman before they invented him right here. This guy's amazing. Verse 4, the Bible says it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And again, we find noticeably absent a phrase, namely that he was of the Lord that he sought occasion against the Philistines. We simply find that Samson at this point feels as though vengeance is his and that as far as will and emotion and desire goes, he can do whatever he wants to wherever he wants to and he can go and be with anyone he wants to and now he's been with a harlot in Gaza and now he loves a woman, a separate woman, uh, and her name is Delilah. And again, we see where her loyalties lie. It's strange because we find that though Samson is a guy who before he was born was supposed to be set apart unto the Lord, he has no concern. He's rather cavalier and careless about holiness and about things of the Lord. And yet we find that every woman that Samson, uh, that Samson is with, either his wife or the harlot or Delilah, all of them have allegiances with their people, the Philistines. Now, friend, here's an example for us, or here is some teaching for us uh, to apply. Listen, my friend, there's no doubt where the allegiance of the wicked is. And so many times we want to give the benefit of the doubt to wicked people, and we want to assume that in them there is good. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh after God. And so, what we recognize here is that Samson, because he thinks so much of himself, he naturally thinks that these individuals will be loyal to him instead of to their people who are wicked. The Philistines were wicked. If you want to research and look at why it is that God wiped out the Philistines, it was because of their wickedness. And so Samson goes into a woman who is one of them, and expects that somehow she's going to have an allegiance to him instead of to her people. It turns out he's very wrong. My friend, when you're careless about the matters of separation and matters of holiness, the way that Samson is, you'll also be rather naive about the motives of people who are wicked. And that's precisely what we find in Samson's instance. You know what happens with her she keeps begging him 
to tell him the source of his strength. And he said, you know what it is? He said, you, you know, I have to be bound with green rope. I mean, it has to be the fiber. It still has to be fresh and green. If it's dry, I can pop right out of it. But if it's green, I'm weak. And so they bound him with widths. And he went, pop. She said, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he just, in verse 8, the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths, which had not been dried. She bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He brake the widths, as a thread of tow is broken when it touches the fire, so his strength was not known. Friend, when you become reckless about association with sin, you also become unreasonable. And here we find Samson actually goes bonkers. I'm serious. He really just goes off of his nut. He's not being reasonable at all. Okay, if you have a girlfriend and you fall asleep around her, after she's talked you into telling her the source of your strength, and you tell her something that isn't true about the source of your strength, but she hides Philistines in the bedroom and then ties you up with the very thing that you said would compromise your strength, while you're sleeping, she ties you up and then says... The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. That ought to be rather much of an awakening. <laughs> you ought to say, you know, I'm not sure she likes me. Or, if she likes me, she has a very strange way of showing it. <laughs> it might be she has a sick desire to watch Philistines being thrown out of windows or something. <laughs> You know, and she's just playing and having fun. But, you know, I think I'm playing with fire here. You know, Samson knew that, didn't he? Samson has gone from recklessness to an insane belief that the God who gave him unbelievable supernatural strength somehow owes it to him to continue allowing him to do as he's doing. In other words, Samson has the notion at this time that no matter what he does, God has got to endorse him. You say, Pastor, I don't know about that. My friend, it's in human nature. You get away with something a couple of times and you'll be surprised at how reckless you'll get to be about doing the very thing you get away with. <coughs> at first, you did it a little bit tentatively, a little bit secretly, and then it went pretty well. And you think, well, you know, I mean... I don't know. It doesn't seem like God's going to do anything. And you start getting taking more and more chances. And it's sort of like getting real close to a pit or a big hole. When I hear a story about a big hole my mom dug one time, I found out, my wife and I did actually this year, that there is a, there is a genetic propensity in our family to dig holes, at least on my mom's side. I never wondered, I never understood why it was a thing for me to dig a six-foot hole or whatever, and then I started hearkening back to my childhood days and remembering some things. We were in Natoma, Kansas, where my mom grew up at uh, my uncle's a year or two ago, right? And her and her brother were talking about holes that they dug around the farm, and they couldn't swim. They tried to dig wells. Like, how many kids try to dig a well? Like, really try to dig a well. Like, you know, 15 feet down, you know, they, I mean, it's one thing for a little kid to you know, dig a hole, right? Your kids dug holes in your backyard. They make it 15 feet? Okay, so this is my mom's family. They dug, dug a hole, and they were trying to dig a well, and I don't remember if they ever got water, if it ever ended up being a good well, but the hole was there, and she was talking about her and her brother were walking along, and it was raining so much, the ground was covered in water. They're walking along, and her brother fell in the hole they dug. And, boom. and of course, he couldn't swim, but somehow he survived it. She said, yes, that... She said to Gene, is that why you're so afraid of water? She says to him. <laughs> because he almost drowned in his hole. And they were just telling him, well, we dug a hole here, we dug a hole here. Well, when I was a kid, my mom dug a hole on our farm. I was uh, almost four years old. Yes, almost four years old, or right around four years old. And my mom was digging an outhouse on our farm because my dad would have workers come out to the farm and then... Uh, they would want to come in the house and use our bathroom. And she didn't like that. She said, these greasy, grimy guys, keep them outside. So she made an outhouse. My mom, that's my mom. She'd build anything or make anything. She dug a six-foot hole for the outhouse. Big hole. Now, when I was a kid, the hole looked like it was maybe from here to the wall. And, uh, you know, about 
here to the back wall, but it really wasn't quite that big. I think it, in actuality was only about six foot wide and six foot deep and about four foot this way. So a rectangle, about four foot this way, six foot down and six foot wide. And my mom said, don't go near the hole. And so I didn't. But I did want to look at the hole. didn't want to go near it, but I did want to look at the hole. And I remember uh, going close to the hole, you know, and thinking, well, she said not to go near it. So if the hole's over here, I said, I'm not going to go near it. I'm four years old. I'm looking at the hole. But you know, you really can't see in a hole very well unless you get at least to some degree within proximity, not near, but within proximity. So I was being careful. I thought, well, if I go on the side of the pile of dirt, then I'm okay, right? Like if there's a pile of dirt between me and the hole, I'm not really near the hole, I'm near the pile of dirt. Am I right? Is this logical, at least to a four-year-old? This is logical to you as adults. It's certainly logical to a four-year-old. So I got the pile of dirt between me. And then I'm thinking, she didn't say don't go near the pile of dirt, so I can get on the pile of dirt. And if I get on the pile of dirt, I'll be able to see in the hole. So I got on the pile of dirt. And I could. I could see in the hole. I don't know why a four-year-old wants to look in a hole. There, you know, <laughs> But it was a hole, and I wanted to see. Okay? And so then I started getting dirt clods, you know, and throwing dirt clods off the pile and throwing dirt clods in the hole. And then, I don't know why, but I decided, you know, Jericho the hole, you know, go around it seven times. So I decided at a safe distance to walk around the hole. I, I can remember this. I was four years old. I remember like it was yesterday. Going around the hole, and I'm like, hey, you know, something to run around. So I start picking up speed. I start going around the hole, you know, throwing dirt clods. And all of a sudden, I made a misstep, and I was in that thing. And a four-year-old cannot get out of a six-foot hole. Can't do it. It was straight walls. My mom dug nice-looking holes. Straight walls, straight up and down. This is in Kansas where they have hard dirt, not sand. And I'm in the hole, and I can't get out. I'm in there jumping, you know, hitting the wall, trying to dig, whatever. And, you know, you can yell for help in a hole, but you're in a hole. And it's like, you know, oh. Sound doesn't come out of the hole. I don't know how long I was in the hole until my mom found me, but there I was. So you know, that's kind of the way we are sometimes when it comes to getting ourselves into things. Sometimes we just get to where we're, you know, I'm going to stay away. I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm going to be real careful. I'm allowed to do this. But after a while, we start to thinking, well, you know what? She said, don't go near the hole, but how near is near? You know, like, you know, is an inch near? Is a foot near? Is 30 feet near? She didn't say. Pretty soon I'm in the hole. And that's oftentimes the way things escalate. The fact is, is that the good kids in our church here who have good parents, and they're certainly better than I am, their children would know that don't go near the hole means don't go near the hole. In other words, don't go near the hole means don't have that direction. The hole's over there. Don't go near the hole. Well, how near is near? Well, near is a direction. If you don't go there, you won't ever get there. And Samson had this issue, this problem of, well, this didn't hurt anything, and this didn't hurt anything, well, this didn't hurt anything. God's always been with me. And the Bible says that this same woman who tied him up with the, with the green withs, that in verse 10, it says, Delilah said, Thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Verse 11, If they bind me fast with new ropes that were never occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. You know what happens? Didn't work. In verse 15, verse 14, he's got her weaving his hair. You see that? Let's look at verse or actually 13. Delilah said to him, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me where thou mightest be bound. Now, isn't this just a charming little dialogue between Samson and Delilah? Hey, you little fella, you've been lying to me. Now, tell me the truth. Well, let's play a game. You know, I'll tell you how you can try to kill me, and you try to kill me, and we'll see if I don't get killed. That's literally the game he's playing. And he has become reckless, and he's become arrogant in his recklessness. And now he's said, if you weave my hair, and you tie it, if thou, you weave the seven locks of my head with the web. And so she did. She fastened it with the pen. She, she locked him up with his hair. Tied his hair. Weaved his hair. 
the seven locks of his hair, weaved them together, and tied them up. And the Bible says he waked out of his sleep and went away with the pen of the beam and with the web. <laughs> so he's got a web and he walks off and it's dragging behind him attached to his head. <laughs> Cut something in your hair, Samson. Let me get that for you. And she told him, she said, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lies. And in verse 17, verse 16 says, She urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Let me ask you a practical question. Did Samson believe that? <coughs> Did Samson believe that if his head was shaved, he'd be a normal man in strength? I don't think he really did, do you? See, Samson had become delusional. Because Samson had played with fire, and it hadn't killed him, he had begun to take very, very lightly who God was and who the enemies of God were. He is not here at all taking seriously Delilah's willingness to betray him and kill him. And she's shown him three times that she's willing to kill him if it will happen. And then she cries and says, You don't even love me because you won't let me kill you. And it broke him down and he told her how to kill him. And the guy's absolutely nuts at this point. Don't you agree? <coughs> He's absolutely bonkers out of his mind. He's playing with his life, and more tragically, a man who has more knowledge of who God is and what God can do than anyone else in the coast of Israel doesn't care a bit about God and His holiness. And he cares everything about a woman that's willing to kill him. Where to get started? Where to come from? I think it came from recklessness. I think it came from a desire of vengeance. The willingness to not have a problem with the wicked unless they do something against you. But Samson doesn't have a problem with the Philistines because they have his countrymen in bondage. He doesn't have a problem with the Philistines because they're wicked and they hate his God. He has a problem with the Philistines if they cross him. And it really doesn't even bother him what they do to God. Holiness does not register with him, and he is a privileged individual to know what a holy God is and what even the principles of separation, of keeping yourself holy, mean. Literally, God had set standards for Samson. He was never to cut his hair. He was never to drink strong drink. He was never to touch a dead carcass. And yet he did all of those things with the exception of cutting his hair, and he didn't think it would matter if he cut his hair. And so you know the story. Cut his hair, he thought, well, let's, let's read it. In verse 20, she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. He literally cared so little about having God's presence in his life that it had no effect on him when God left him. What was the source of Samson's strength? God. What? God. God was the source of Samson's strength. It wasn't the locks of his hair. But when Samson had turned against God and turned against God and turned against God and turned against God, God said, okay, Samson, go ahead and cut your hair. And when he cut his hair... The Holy Spirit left and he never even knew it. He didn't feel a thing. He woke up. You know, he really wasn't feeling God anyway. Just when he needed Him. God was nothing more than a convenient tool for Samson to wreak his own vengeance on whoever crossed him. There's never a notion of this is right, this is wrong, this is what God wants, this is what God hates. It was a matter of this is what I want and 
I'm sure God's fine with it. You say, Pastor, how could anyone be like that? Yeah, how could we be like that? Well, we are, aren't we, sometimes? Yeah. See, the truth of the matter is Samson's really relatable at this point. It's actually incredible how little we're concerned with what God thinks about our actions and our behavior. How the last thing we think about when we are going through life and making decisions is what God thinks. And subsequently, how little aware we are of whether God is with us or not with us. And can I say to you that God being God and us being men, that we ought to be more with God than God with us? Isn't so? And yet most of us never consider God's best or God's desire. We consider our best. When was the last time you made a decision, a life decision, on the basis of how could God be glorified in this? What's God's best? You know, we always think, well, you know what, how's this going to work out for me? What's best for me? God, what's best for me? Instead of God, it's a privilege to be the only person in the world that knows you the way that I do. And God, I just want to please you. I want to know what your best is. And literally, from the beginning, you never see Samson adopting that attitude. Did God use Samson? Yeah. Yes, He did. In verse 28, we know about how that Samson's eyes were put out and they used him like, like a beast of burden and had him just... You know, pull a, uh, uh, what's it called, a grind mill or a grist mill or whatever it is. But in verse 27, they're having, a, they're having, verse 25, I guess, they're having a party and they want to make fun of Samson, really make fun of his God. Verse 25, it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house and he made them sport and they set him between the pillars. They literally made the man a joke. And they, they did whatever they told him to do. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the, men, the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that they held while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, now here we're ready for Samson to have a revival, right? Ready for him to have an awakening and acknowledge God for who he is. Samson is now calling out to God, but he said, Remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. <laughs> and that isn't funny, is it? You know the tragedy of Samson? The tragedy of Samson is that he thinks his eyeballs being poked out are the great grievance in the world. I'm not making light of having your eyeballs poked out. That's offensive. But having a child of the king of kings be made sport of is making fun of God. When they're making fun of Samson, what are they making fun of? <coughs> they're making fun of a man who was once so strong because God's Spirit was in him. And now he's so weak because God's Spirit has left him. And a man who is alone in a way that he'd never experienced in his life. See, he's from a child, from a youth. If you read, when he grew up in, in, in the coast of the children of Dan, he, the Bible says he did great feats. Like literally the man his whole life had supernatural ability and strength. And he's come to a place in his life when he's lost that. And what he laments is not losing that special thing that he had from God. What he laments is, I lost my eyes and they're making fun of me. The Bible says he pushed the pillars. God's power came on him. He pushed the pillars. And they collapsed with 3,000 Philistines and the lords of the Philistines on them. And they, of course, collapsed on Samson and everybody was killed, including him. And the end of Samson's life actually reads this way. 
And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord, so upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And that's the end. They bury Samson after that. 20 years after he began to be a judge in Israel. Did God do Samson? Was this victory of the leadership of the Philistines insignificant? No, it actually delivered the children of Israel from the Philistines. It was the greatest thing Samson had done in his life. God used him in a greater way in his death than he'd been used in his entire life. But the tragedy of it all is that he had no regard for the God that used him. The Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he moveth it whithersoever he will. I have seen corrupt individuals do good things. And the only explanation for what they've done, in comparison to what they say they would do and what they desire to do, the only explanation I have for them doing good is that God made them. Of course, God can take an evil person, or God can take a person who has evil intentions, and God can still do good because He's God. And it's amazing when you look at God. See, in every example, every good example of a bad example, we've had to look at God. And every time we've had to say, God is amazing. God has an incredible ability to use people in spite of their sin, in spite of their flaws. The tragedy of Samson is that I look at him and humanly speaking, he's everybody's favorite judge. I mean, Samson's movie material, isn't he? You look at the things Samson did, you can make a movie out of the guy's life. It's fascinating. It's exciting. It's uh, every bit of Samson's life just appeals to the senses. Make a great movie. I'm sure they have Samson movies, don't they? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> Makes a great movie. Realistically, though, when you look at Samson's life, there's a good example of how that he sought occasion against the Philistines. And that was of the Lord. But tragically, that's about it. Because Samson is really just a good example of a bad example. Why? Well, specifically, <coughs> he never really cared for God. Of course, he used the ability, the ability that God gave him, and God marvelously used him for good, actually, for his people. But the tragedy of it is, is that he could have had a relationship with God. And here's the deal. Could God have used Samson if he didn't have a revengeful spirit in himself? If Samson had said, okay, the Bible says that vengeance is God's. Could God have used Samson without there being any, you did this to me, now I'll do this to you? Yes. He surely could have. Did God use him anyway? Yes. Yeah, he did. But you know what Samson is? He's an example of revenge. And how it consumes you and eats up your heart. He's an example of a person who was privileged and loved God, and yet instead of loving the one who'd done so much for him, he loved those that hated his God. He's a good example of willingness to betray, to play with sin, to mock evil. And you know, for the most part, one of the greatest judges in Israel that God used for good. Almost his entire life is a good example of a bad example. God can use you. Amazingly, God uses me in spite of myself sometimes. Do we have any witnesses about that? 
that God uses me in spite of me. But friend, wouldn't it be better if God used me because of my willingness to be used by Him for His perfect will? <coughs> I have to think that you couldn't have poked Samson's eyes out if that had been the relationship he had with God. I have to think that he would have never had to stand before the Philistines and have them make him dance in front of them and make sport of him, make a joke out of him. And for that reason, Samson is one of the best examples, good example of a bad example. Father, help us to not be like Samson in this way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your attention tonight. You're dismissed. That was a good sermon, Mrs. Price. <laughs> <laughs>